This is WCN. The Whole Care Network. You talk. We listen. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Have you ever met anybody that has caregiving on their bucket list of things to do in life? Beyond caregiving, how do we care? We also have to care for ourselves. How do we treat friends, family, strangers we meet? Ah, forget it. How do we heal? The physical, social, financial, spiritual. Hello. Creating healing ties. Tying it all together like a bow tie. With your host, Christopher McClellan, the bow tie guy. Well, greetings, everyone. It is Christopher McClellan. You know me as the bow tie guy, and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0, featured on the Whole Care Network. And as you know, we are on our final week of recording our 30 and 30 podcast celebrating National Family Caregivers Month and the soft launch of our new Whole Care Network website. So we're asking all of our listeners to, well, first you got to go and visit the old site, wholecarenetwork.com, and you'll see the link to the new site. It's not that confusing, but it's right there on the front page. And when you get to the new site, you'll meet a fellow by the name of Bo because Bo ties things together on the Whole Care Network. When you see Bo, you're going to get it 100%. (laughs) I just know that you will. And during our soft launch, we're asking all of our listeners to provide us with feedback on the new site so we can continue to build our site where you can easily find your favorite podcasts, favorite blogs, and videos. Oh, and uh, by the way, you'll be able to search content on the Whole Care Network via our four pillars of care our physical, social, financial, and spiritual health. And to be on the lookout for our new YouTube channel featuring live shows, our streaming 24-7 radio station, and a few other exciting changes coming to the Whole Care Network in 2021. Well, (laughs) enough from me. My guest on this episode of Healing Ties is geriatric patient advocate and medical student, Victoria Tia. Kozar. We're going to go by Tia today, aren't we, Victoria? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've already yeah. done it, Tia. <laughs> so I'm not going to go through the formal introduction because you have so many wonderful things. I'm, going to, I, I'm just going to kind of talk, talk you through it. But I want to welcome you to Healing Ties. Tia, thank you for joining me. And thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh, my gosh. I, as I read your bio and, and looked into the, some of the things that you're doing, I, you spent a year living with older adults in an assistant living community. That was a student in residence program, your certified end of life specialist, leading age Connecticut aging service award excellence in 2019. You're on the Steve Harvey show and you're continuing to positively influence caring and ageism. I think I should just turn the microphone over to you. So. Yes. Oh, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but please, I've tried, I've summarized a little bit, but let our listeners know about your background and your passion. And I, I want to start off, then start off talking about that living in the uh, senior living center. Yeah, so I mean, that's kind of where a lot of this took off. So spending a year living um, in assisted living really kind of catapulted my interest in geriatrics. So after spending a year there, I developed some friendships that I have to this day. So four years later, um, I still go to visit one of one of my best friends, Beth, who, who still lives there. 
And then over the last couple of years, she started experiencing cognitive decline. So as someone in my early 20s, I really didn't know what to do. Didn't know how to approach that. I didn't know how to be a good friend. So I, I contacted my local chapter of the Alzheimer's Association and, and found a love for the field. Um, I got involved with their health policy team. So right now I'm an Alzheimer's advocate at a state and national level. Um, and on top of that, too, um, I spent two years um, as a dementia care coordinator at a couple skilled nursing facilities. And I just want to give a voice for those who don't always have a voice for themselves. So you've experienced this firsthand by kind of living in the community. And I, I guess one of the one of the things that would come to mind right off the top of my bat, when you recognize or you get that first instance that something just might be a little bit wrong with your friend, and what do you do? Because all families go through this, that first instance to where you recognize that there's an issue going on with memory. Yeah, I, I think the first instinct for a lot of people is to assume that it's a natural part of aging and it's not. It's not. Um, right. I think we're conditioned to, to think that way, but a lot of times things go too long. Uh, it started with a few times where, where things would be a little repetitive. And I'm like, oh, you know, she's just telling me a story again. Um, then it was kind of having a hard time even, even finding my name. Um, she knew she knew me. Um, right. And then it would take a couple seconds for her to realize. She's like, this is my friend. And then it would have to pause. And it would make my heart sink because I, I saw how much she was struggling with it. And, and I wanted to help her out because I saw how some of the other residents responded to that. I think they all kind of have a, a bad taste in their mouth about, about memory loss, especially in an assisted living community. You know, they see those people who live in like, the memory care mm -hmm. part. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that there's a lot of stigma to go with that. It wasn't always very supportive. Yeah, and that, uh, that, that stigma really plays havoc with everybody. When, but when you can educate yourself just a little bit, it's, isn't it amazing how the stigma kind of goes away? Oh, and, and it goes such a long way too. even just having a, a little conversation um, about, hey, how, how about we, we make the community a little more supportive so, so she can stay here longer um, and how we can be a good neighbor. There's ways that, you know, if, if it were you, wouldn't you want someone to, you know, walk you back to your, to your apartment or help you with a meal? It really does go a long way. So I, I, I really want to get your perspective on this. I am, I'm very self-revealing. I'm not asking you to reveal your age, but I, I'm 63. And you may not know this. I have five older siblings ranging from 72 to 81. And one of them, oh, there's experience. Oh, oh, she's yeah, experiencing men, memory loss. That was a difficult conversation to have with her kids who are my age or so close to my age. But looking at this from an intergenerational perspective, I mean, you're really on the, the uh, leading age of, of creating an awareness for younger folks about this insidious disease. Yeah, I think one of the most important things is, is to make sure that that dignity is maintained I think as soon as someone notices a change, sometimes their behavior immediately changes. You don't even mean to, and sometimes they're, you know, talking extra slow. Mm -hmm. And you know that these they're people too. It, it could happen to you. It could happen to your mother. It could happen to to anyone. And I think having those conversations early on, especially in college, in graduate school, it doesn't matter what field you're going to go into. You're going to see people as they get older. You could right. be an accountant and you'll be having clients who are older. It doesn't have to just be medicine. Uh, it could be your neighbor. Um, so I, I think people put aging in a silo and it really isn't. It affects everyone. And we, we all want to age and we want to age as happily as we can. Uh, but uh, yeah, I kind of like what you said a little bit. It really does take a team and a village to all of us, for all of us to age healthily. But we have to be aware of what the issues are. And I think now more than ever, especially with everything that's happened this year, the importance of, like I said, being a good neighbor, check in on the person who lives down the street from you, make sure that people can get what they need. Mm -hmm. So the, it's almost like a silver lining, I guess, where, where we right. see how, how we have failed some of our most vulnerable and, hey, how can we make this better? <laughs> yeah, and, and COVID has had a tremendous impact on the Alzheimer's community. And in skilled nursing, assisted living as well, the effect of the isolation, 
just just hearing I mean I was I was in a nursing home at the beginning of all this and and just the sadness of not being able to see their families especially at the beginning when when I, you know we were afraid mm. uh, it, it definitely uh, did a number on everybody so I want to come back now you're in medical school tell, yeah. tell me about your experience in medical school and how you've been able to apply your experience, uh, your life experience in these senior living communities and, and your advocacy work? Uh, I think it's important. Uh, a lot of times we talk about like the standard patient being, you know, a middle-aged, a middle-aged man. Um, but even just the way some of uh, the faculty has, has addressed aging, we had a biostatistics professor who was like, if you had to save uh, one person, would it be 90, 80 year olds or one 40 year old? And it was in regards to a cost benefit oh ratio. And I, I was the one who sat up and I was like, well, we don't know what quality of life those 80 year olds are living. We can't assume that they don't have a quality of life. I think it's important that we we don't address people as they're getting older as d- dispensable. So I think it's just being the person to ask those questions when people are having those dialogues because people just, uh, make assumptions that that's normal that most people who, as they age, you know, do not have a good quality of life. I've seen plenty of people into their 90s who are are finding love, finding new hobbies. Uh, So I I think it's just kind of challenging the norm. And anytime you can, and the more times you can have that conversation, and the more people who are listening, I think it's so important. Breaking down those stereotypes. Not, there's no cookie cutter to aging. Oh, no. But, and I mean, it goes both ways, though. Uh, Living uh, in this in the assisted living community, I mean, I think they had certain assumptions about college students coming to live with them as well. So I think it was kind of mutually beneficial. Where I think they were expecting us to be throwing keggers, uh, <laughs> and <laughs> when, then we were we when were they were probably <laughs> throwing the keggers themselves. You would you'd be surprised. <laughs> well, so let, let's talk a little bit about the experience, and you know what what changed you from from the time that you walked into the door at the senior living community to the day that you walked out? what Was there something that you noticed right away about that was different about yourself? Absolutely. I, I think there were some subconscious biases even I had going in where the relationships I thought that I would have, I thought it was going to be like having a whole bunch of grandparents. The kind of relationship you have with the grandparents, I thought we would, you know, kind of have conversations about the Yankees and, you know, have some cookies. But I found that at at the end of the day, we talked as if we were friends, as if we were equals. And I think that was a very interesting dynamic where we had so many shared experiences, whether it be culture, a favorite meal, fears, things we were looking forward to in the next year, that I think that really opened my eyes to the fact that friendship doesn't have any age. It knows no age. Friendship doesn't have any age. It's how people connect. And then when we share our stories, we find out that, you know what, we're not really that much different from one another when we just sit and talk to one another. All it takes is a little bit of listening. <laughs> That's right. I keep, you know, as I, as you get back into podcasting and as we're growing the network, uh, it's funny that you mentioned listening. I, people say, well, are you going to do a talk show? And I said, well, we're probably going to do something. It's probably going to be live, but I'm thinking it's more of a listening show, not a talk show, because listening is one of those areas of communication that often people don't pay much attention to. It definitely gets neglected. (laughs) It definitely gets neglected. So uh, not being very well versed in science, I want to know how medical school is going for you. Uh, it's it's going well uh, in in the virtual age that we are in now. It's yeah. definitely not what I expected. Um, seeing a cadaver on camera rather than being in there is a, mm. a little bit different. Right. But every day there's a new challenge and there's a way to overcome it. And I I, I guess it's safe to assume that you're going to be entering into geriatric care. Oh, absolutely. I there's very few things I'm certain of, but that I love that more than anything. Yeah, because, you know, it's interesting, and I haven't read the statistics here recently, but I know at least a couple of years ago, uh, when I was heavily involved in social work here in South Florida, you know, the statistics were, there's not a lot of uh, medical professionals focusing on geriatrics, but I'm sensing that that's changing. If I have anything to do with it, (laughs) you know, I think people are seeing aging in a different light. There's a lot less fear 
I, and I think people are talking about mental health more and other things more that I, I think a lot of the stigmas are being broken down. But I, I think it is still important to catch people early on with that, with that interest because I think it's a field people don't even think about going into. A lot of my peers are like, that's something I can specialize in. I can do that. That's an option. So um, I think it, there's still a lot of work to do. And your work with end of life, we really haven't touched on that. I'd, I'd, I'd like to like to hear your perspectives on and how you got involved with uh, the cert- certificate program. Yeah, it was one of those things where working in a skilled nursing facility, I felt there was things I could do more for my residents, especially when it came to end of life. Uh, sometimes I'd be coming in on my shift at seven o'clock in the morning and someone would be actively passing. And, you know, the, it's not the first thing you want to see. I'm like, I haven't even finished my coffee yet, but right. this, is, this is this person's final moments. And I wanted to have every tool in my tool belt to make sure that it was dignified, um, that I knew all of the different religious backgrounds to make sure that, you know, their last rites were read, um, that they were able uh, to pass gracefully. And uh, that the, fa- the families had the tools to be ready for that when it was, was to come. I worked a lot with the families who, who were on hospice, just preparing them for, for what that was going to look like uh, and how they wanted it to look like. Because it's often an unknown experience. Even if you've gone through it once or twice, it's still going to be a different experience. And one thing that you said there that really hit me and touched me uh, was the different religious experiences. End of life uh, means it's, it's different for different faith backgrounds. And when you can communicate that background for that particular family, that draws you even a little bit closer to that family. Yeah. And unfortunately this kind of came from, from seeing it done wrong. Um, right. There was, there was one morning report uh, where someone had passed overnight and they weren't read their last rites and the family was furious and I was furious for them. I was like, you know, that for their religion, that person is not resting peacefully and we can't have that on. I, I couldn't there's, have no that re- on there's no redo. Mm-mm. So I made it my mission after that. I was like, we need to make sure that that this is, you, you only you only have one shot. <laughs> so let, let's make it a good one. What, what the advocate, you are such a great advocate. Oh, thank you. Uh, if you if you practice in Florida, I'm signing up for your, <laughs> I'm, signing up. I'm uh, signing up for your practice. So. Well, I'm saying the weather in Connecticut, I might be moving to Florida. <laughs> so there you go. Come on down. <laughs> so goodness. Well, Tina, this is, Tia, this is a great uh, place to for us to take our break and like i'm doing with all of our guests here on our 30 and 30 reboot of healing ties when we come back i want to ask you one fun fact about you we got a lot of great facts today and they <laughs> uh but i we're going to ask you one fun fact that we did cover today and that all our listeners would want to know so you got to put your thinking cap on okay hopefully i have something fun <laughs> i think you probably will okay you're listening to healing ties on the whole care network We will be right back. Tomorrow on Healing Ties 2.0. We didn't want people just to get by or to, you know, hang on by their fingernails as they're going through this caregiving journey is that we wanted to help people understand that, you know, there are really good aspects to this and that there's a way to not just to get by, but actually to thrive, to help them see the gifts and the graces and the blessings that come in their caregiving journey. We're finding that caregivers, the ones that we're interacting with on a day in, day out basis, have started to recognize those blessings. You know, there's a silver lining in this pandemic. And in that silver lining, there's been a refocus on family, on being present to one another. And in doing so, you know, many of the things, Kelly, you and I talk about with Nourish and helping people to really reestablish those relationships is one of the silver linings of the pandemic that it's brought to us. I'm Kelly Johnson. And I'm Deb Kelsey Davis. And together we're co-founders of Nourish for Caregivers and co-authors of The Caregiver Companion by Ave Maria Press. And we are so excited. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving, and we hope you will join us as we go with Chris McClellan on a journey that will nourish your soul on healing ties. We're so excited. We hope you join us. Join us tomorrow and every day in November for 30 shows in 30 days. Healing Ties 2.0, available at thewholecarenetwork.com slash healing ties and wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.
Well, welcome back, everybody. I am continuing my delightful conversation with Victoria Tia Kozar. Victoria, you are just so impressive. I'm just, I, oh, I didn't have this focus at, well, I don't even have this focus at 60, more or less. Uh, with, uh, I'm not going to be self-revealing, but okay, I'm going to stop gushing and oh, come, back the, come back to the, come back to the, the point at hand. We want to know a fun fact about you that wasn't revealed in this conversation. And I'd be like, oh my gosh, we've like went through your whole life almost here. But uh, So what is that one fun, fun fact we all want to know? So I'm actually very passionate about circus fitness. I practiced for two years, all kinds of aerial arts, whether it be uh, acrobatic yoga, silks, hoop, you name it, uh, anything to get me flying. <laughs> Trapeze? Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> it's, it's on the list. <laughs> it's on the list. Uh, we have... We have a guest that we can connect you with who, she, who she does. She, she did. She actually, she was our, she was our second guest. She does trapeze. So I, Ooh. I can contact, I can connect you with her. So, oh, now how did you get into that? There happened to be a gym down the road for me. And mm -hmm. I, I've always been one to kind of want to find a way to have a mind body connection, but I, I wasn't really into yoga or meditating. I am a little too high strung for that. So I needed something a little bit more active and uh, adrenaline-y. <laughs> well, that will certainly do it. Oh, it does. <laughs> yeah. So what other programs do you have in the offering? You're, you're in school. You, you're doing any other advocacy work? I guess medical school would be too busy to do really anything else on the outside. Well, I'm actually founding an American Geriatric Society chapter at UConn starting um, in the next year. I'm hoping to <laughs> to find other students, uh, even people in other specialties. I think I can run educational workshops just on like having those difficult conversations, dealing with caregivers and families. I think there's something everyone can gain from having some of those tools. I would like to be a part of that. You're more than welcome to. Okay. I'll, <laughs> be happy to share, I'll, be, I'll be happy to share our story. So goodness. So Tia, we just have a couple of minutes left in the podcast today. How can our listeners find more information about you and your work? Uh, for before, I'm not even, I'm not even going to talk about me first. If anyone needs any resources, the best resources, the, Ameri um, the Alzheimer's Association hotline, and that's 1-800-272-3900. Because I want to make sure that no one is in the situation that I was in. I don't wish that upon anyone. You want to have all the information you can, especially with the holidays coming up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to find me, I'm uh, Victoria Kozar on LinkedIn or at Tia K-O-Z-A-R on Instagram. Yeah. <laughs> and your LinkedIn page is is quite uh, impressive and very well organized. Oh, too. Well, <laughs> I'm a little type A, but that goes with the medical student. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's a good thing. You wouldn't want me as a medical student, that's for sure. So, you know, Tia, with the stories you share and the work that you do, you are certainly someone who's creating healing ties all around us. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I can't thank you enough for sharing your story. It's really a, an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with you today. It's been such a pleasure to meet you. And thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. Goodness. Well, that does it for this episode of Healing Ties. As you know, I'm your host, Christopher McClellan. You probably know me as the Bowtie Guy. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends by, being, by sharing stories, resources, and being with awesome people like Tia Kozar. Healing Ties is produced in the Posh studios of Oddbox Production in downtown St. Louis, Missouri, and is part of the Whole Care Network. Check out the soft launch of our new Whole Care Network website and be sure to meet Bo, because Bo ties things together on the Whole Care Network. And subscribe to Healing Ties wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We'll see you for another episode of Healing Ties well, uh, tomorrow as we continue our 30 podcasts in 30 days to celebrate National Family Caregivers Month. Thanks for listening. Take care. Bye for now.
This is WCN. The Whole Care Network. You talk. We listen.